Good evening and welcome to Tonight with Tim Modise. In the show tonight, we discuss the recent debate in Parliament on state capture. The organization Undoing Tax Abuse, as Chief Operating Officer Ben Teron, will talk to us about their fight against corruption. And later in the show, we will be looking at the campaigns for the ANC elective conference with the Sowetan political editor, Mwipwone Malefani. State capture has become central to political discourse in the country. Serious allegations of corruption in government and especially at state-owned entities have dominated the news over the past few years. The most damning allegations came through the so-called Gupta leaks earlier this year, which showed that various prominent people were involved in alleged corrupt activities with the Gupta family. President Jacob Zuma has also been found to be implicated in some of these activities, and this led to the former public protector advocate Tulima Tonsela asking the president to institute a judicial commission of inquiry. As we speak, Parliament is having four separate hearings into these alleged corrupt activities, with the most recent being the parliamentary SNEP debate this past Tuesday. The organization Undoing Tax Abuse has lodged a variety of charges against individuals and organizations, and they've also been active in the fight against corruption. The Chief Operating Officer of Outer is Ben Teron, and he's with me in the studio to talk about their efforts. Ben, good evening and welcome. Good evening to you, Tim, and good evening to your listeners. Why does state capture matter so much in the politics of South Africa at this moment? In terms of politics, it, let's just, just put aside the politics. It affects the normal citizens of Africa, people like you and me. And the reason why it affects us is because if you look at the amount of money SARS brings in, it's about 1.6 trillion rand. Easily, we calculated that 200 billion rand has just gone on, this on the side. That 200 billion rand can do the following, as an, a few examples. Number one, schooling. Education system in South Africa is broken. Healthcare, 143 people died with the SED many thing, and that's purely because of corruption. Number three, it's about the uh, social security agency taking care of the vulnerable in society. 200 billion rand is a lot of money, and that can be used to ensure that people like you and I live a better life, as well as just generally taking care of society. Now these numbers get bandied about and there are people who deny the numbers, say they are just made up. It's not true that so much money is lost to corruption. One example, a 50 billion rand contract for locomotives, 5 billion rand of that got taken off the top purely for, for bribes. Now 5 billion rand multiply with a few, ESCOM, Adbraza, Transnet, just a few of those and immediately you're already beyond the 30 billion rand threshold. And it doesn't take a lot to add up, although 200 billion rand is a lot of money. What do you say to people who deny that the state capture should be a major concern in South Africa, saying that it is a creation of white monopoly capital and it is people who are opposed to radical economic transformation who are pushing for investigations into this state capture? An example, for instance, is the fact that the former public protector advocate Tulima Donsela already has suggested, has recommended, as remedial action that a judicial commission of inquiry should be held speedily. It's more than a year now and we haven't seen anything come about this and we've had, we have those uh, inquiries that I mentioned that are going, uh, taking place in Parliament. What is going on? Number one, people debate theoretically what is state capture. State capture pure and simply is corruption. It's money being stolen from the state coffers and the other debate is, should we be holding government account and what about private sector? We don't care who steals. It is your and my money that gets stolen. It's been more than a year where the public protector said, this needs to be investigated through a judicial inquiry. And games are being played at that level. And so far, the president have lied, he's lied, and he's lied. Ministers have gone to parliament and they've lied. What has happened specifically in the ESCOM case is that a number of senior executives as well as the minister has been to parliament and they're all pointing their fingers like that and say, I didn't know. Mm. Now, if everybody from the top right to executive level say, we didn't know, who should know? If it's not them, who should it be? Parliament has taken some time, has taken a relatively long time to come to the party and address the concerns. As I've mentioned, there are four different hearings taking place and the one that involved the entire parliament happened two days ago. 
What, what, what do you think about the latest developments in as far as public representatives are concerned? If you look at the Constitution, the Parliament is the ultimate body to hold people to account. So when everything goes wrong, it goes right to the pinnacle, and that's where Parliament sits. It's been a long while, and I think that a, a lot of that has a lot to do with the party politics and the pity politics in that happened in Parliament. Somewhere this year, the Parliament has woken up, they've realized that this is a big problem, and they started addressing it. What will happen in the subcommittee for ESCOM, there are similar subcommittees that have been recommended, not established yet, for transport, which Praza and Transnet will be part of, um, the one for social development, and there are five of them in total. Mm. And those, w those committees have been set up specifically based on the information that ARTA has provided to, pro to Parliament that's called No Room to Hide, a President co Court in the Act. So that we did in June, and I think since then, they've woken up to realize that this problem is huge and it needs to be addressed now. We believe this country is burning and it needs to be sorted out quickly. Now, we have seen a situation arise where foreign entities, investigative bodies, get involved in the South African story. They have the FBI in the United States and the authorities in the UK who are investigating transactions within the HSBC uh, banks. But we haven't seen the uh, criminal uh, investigative arms of the state, your NPAs, the Hawks, and so forth, spring into action. Are they, You've, as I've said, that you have launched a variety of uh, charges against uh, those implicated? Have you had any feedback from them? Um, we've had meetings with the Hawks as well as the NPA, and they assure us they're investigating. Now, it is complicated. I've, I've got to give them that uh, benefit of the doubt. However, the cases that we've submitted has all the evidence in it. So each case comes with a dossier, with evidence, with uh, transcripts, all those things are there. So what they need to do is to actual fact validate that the information we provide them is, uh, is correct and it's accurate, and we're working with them. The problem in South Africa is that the courts are so full. If you, if you today go lay a charge, a real charge, you may now in fact only get into court to hear the case somewhere in December next year. That's how full the courts are, and that's part of the problem. Um, we met with the South Africa Council of Churches with the reimagining the New South Africa that mm. we want to build for. And one of the recommendations that came out of there is to, is to ensure that there are dedicated courts allocated to corruption and that we, behind the scenes, we're negotiating that so that these cases can come to court much quicker. Coming back to the Hawks and the MPA. What happened is that the Hawks and the MPA skill set and the top layer of those organizations have been totally decimated. And the skill dirge in the moment at the moment in those places need to be beefed up dramatically because once they, the, the system starts moving, you need competent people, dedicated people to make sure that these cases are investigated first of all and then properly documented so when you get to court, the evidence can stand up. Now, members of parliament, some of them, are saying that they are being threatened, that their lives are now being threatened and those of their families. And these are people who are very proactive in the committees that are investigating the state capture. What's your comment? It is sad that our public representatives need to be threatened with lives. But they are only experiencing what the ordinary citizen in the street experience daily. They have protective services for parliamentarians, and even with that, th um, they get threatened. People like you and me don't have that luxury. We walk in the streets, we get mugged, we get hijacked. And we need to talk about the security and safety sec uh, system in South Africa because corruption, uh, no, crime has really uh, uh, gotten out of hand. What should be the way forward out of this? I mean, we can talk and talk, and the talk has been going on for some time, right? And in a sense, it's becoming toxic, if you will. It's poisoned the whole atmosphere. And, and that's why I made the remark about politics, that you hear state capture, you associate it with bad politics. But of course, the reality is that at an ordinary person's level, we're feeling the effects of the money that's disappearing from the system, right? So what is the easier, quicker way to get out of this? The public protector suggested the Judicial Commission of Inquiry. Will that ever happen, you think? Well, we need to split the things into different levels. What the public protector said is we need a judicial inquiry because evidence show that the president is involved. So you need, at that level, you need a judicial inquiry. You don't need a judicial inquiry to go into ESCOM. You just need an, a forensic order to be done. If you look at the case with Praza, where two contracts were set aside, the 50 billion rand contract that I spoke about earlier, those contracts have been set aside 
Here's the problem. The Hawks, Popo Malefe as chair of the, of the board, went to court. He got the contracts overturned. The Hawks refused to prosecute any of those people implicated. We're actually in court right now, and we're waiting for the court date to, to force the Hawks to do their work. Now, that is sad when you have to take a, a, a public organization to court to do their work. Mm. The information is there. The evidence is there. All that needs to happen is that they must form, form formula docu dockets and go to court to have these people arrested, prosecuted, and they go need to go to jail. Um, we need investigations into various state organs, and almost all of them. Social Security Agency, corrupt. Praza, corrupt. Transnet, corrupt. ESCOM is corrupt. Those are the big ones. But in across the board, it's filtered permit for outside our society. You ask me a question, what should happen? Ordinary South Africans must start standing up and holding people to account. As much as we talk about the big organization, at the local level, in the local municipality, the small town, you see the effects through the, the problem with water provision, electricity provision, and just service provision, where water is not available anymore because the sewage plant stopped working. Those kind of things are, are all at the local level, and that impact on people at the local level, and they must stand up and keep hold their people to account. You've highlighted all of these issues for some time. You've even uh, put out a booklet in that regard, and I think it's available on a website, right? You can give us the address in the meantime. Please give us that address. It's outa, O-U-T-A, yeah. dot C-O dot Z-A. Yeah. All our cases that we've laid so far, uh -huh. amongst others. We've actually laid treason charges against Faith Mutambi and Zwani because they used confidential cabinet information and shared it with the Guptas. Across the board, we've We've laid charges against people like the DG of uh, public enterprises, um, various people, even in private sector, we've laid charges, 16 in total so far. But all those cases are available on outa, O-U-T-A dot C-O dot Z-A. Beautiful reading, it gives beautiful insights about what's happening in South Africa. But we believe as an organization, we need to continuously, on a day-to-day -day basis, fight this. But we need the citizens support to do this because they need to stand up and say enough is enough. And very briefly, Ben, are you confident that ultimately these cases will see the light of day in court and people will be arrested and prosecuted? I give you my word, they will get to court. Because if the process, the official process has gone through and the NPA decide not to prosecute, we will apply for a nolly, I'm not sure what the full name is, that can allow private prosecutions and we will take them to court because we believe these people are taking Sta people's money, our taxpayers' money, and they are wasting it and stealing it. And we will land, put them in court, we will put them in jail. Thank you very much, Ben Teron, for talking to us. Only a pleasure. Nice to be with you. Right. That's the Chief Operating Officer of the organization Undoing Tax Abuse, Outer, talking to us about the extent of uh, corruption in the country, generally now referred to as state capture, and their efforts in fighting the very corruption. In a short time, we will be talking to the editor of the Sowetan newspaper, and we're looking at the dynamics within the ANC in the lead-up to the elective conference in December.